In today's video, we're going to be looking at Jean Baudrillard and his concepts on postmodernism. So, what we're going to be looking at is we're going to look at the key theory about Jean Baudrillard's theories of simulacra and simulations and hyperreality. But I'm going to go on and talk about some stress and challenge theories that aren't part of the main theories for the syllabus. It's Venturi, Scott Brown and Isenor's concepts in postmodernism. We're also going to look at Julia Kristeva's theories of intertextuality. And we're going to look at Jean-Francois Lyotard's concept of incredulity towards meta-narratives. Because whilst these aren't key theories, they're very important, I think, for you to know. Very, very useful. So if we look at Baudrillard's key theory, he says that there's the idea that in postmodern culture, the boundaries between the real world and the real world of the media have collapsed. It's no longer possible to distinguish between reality and simulation. He also talks about the idea that in this postmodern age of simulacra, we're immersed in a world of images which no longer refer to anything that can be considered real. And the idea that media images have come to seem more real than the reality they're supposed to represent, which is a concept he called hyperreality. I'm going to be breaking this down bit by bit and explain what all this means. So, first thing we need to know is what is postmodernism? This is an exceptionally complicated subject, and I'm going to be reducing it to its bare bones, simple as humanly possible basics. Okay, so if anything, this is going to be a gross oversimplification of what postmodernism actually is. This is a movement that has its origins in the early to mid 20th century. It came from art and design, especially architecture, and it can be applied to all cultural products and indeed to studying the entire nature of the society we live in. So, why postmodernism? Well, post obviously means after. So, postmodernism literally means after modernism. So, to understand postmodernism, you're going to need to know what modernism is. Again, I'm going to be making some gross oversimplifications here. Um, the reality is a lot more complicated, but probably more complicated than you need to know for the purpose of A level media studies. And I'm particularly going to be looking at the concept of postmodernism and how it relates to art. Now, again, I'm no art expert, and I am grossly simplifying here, but it'll help you understand the concept of postmodernism. So if we look at the history of art, and what the purpose of art was, is in the classical period, art was about the representation of the true. It was about trying to capture the truth of something. It meant trying to recreate reality, and it was all tied in with concepts of high art and good taste. If we look at this self-portrait by Rembrandt here from 1659, look at how it is a study in light, this beautiful chiaroscuro lighting, how he's trying to realistically capture how light plays on his face. He's trying to capture the essence, the reality, the truth of how he sees himself. I mean, he's gone into incredible amounts of detail to represent his face and the light on it, but you'll notice that the detail of his hands is very sketchy. You know, there's not a lot of detail in it because that's not the important part of the picture. Nonetheless, he's trying to represent a sense of the true, the sublime. There was also an idea that there could be such a thing as objective truth and realism that weren't open to interpretation. Now we call these grand or meta-narratives the big ideas that shape society, the big ideas that we use to understand society. These claimed to be truthful and they help people to make sense of the world. Now what are we talking about with these grand or meta-narratives? We're talking about things like religion. We're talking about history, the concepts of law and order, of right and wrong, of 
political ideas. So we think about history. History is a story a society tells itself. Our national identity as a society is based on this shared sense of history, but it is a story. It is not, you know, whether it is objectively true is a matter of opinion. One of the great cliches is that history is written by the winners. So different people have different opinions about what is historically true. Archaeologists, historians sift through the artifacts of the past and try to make sense of them. But they do that by creating a story. And that story changes and evolves over time as society's attitudes change and evolve over time. So our attitude towards British history is different from how British history was thought of 30, 50, 100 years ago. This is particularly important when we're looking at how the idea of what is true is starting to become questioned. This brings us on to Jean-Francois Lyotard and his idea of incredulity towards meta-narratives. If you are incredulous, you no longer believe something, you are doubting. And one of the key concepts of postmodernism, one of the most important concepts of postmodernism, is that we are starting to doubt those meta-narratives. Things that were once long held truths that couldn't be questioned, the sacred cows of society, are now being questioned. Whether it be we're becoming less and less religious as a society and more and more secular, in the UK at least, and we are questioning ideas of right and wrong, but we're also questioning the old assumptions about things like gender and sexuality, where we're questioning the meta narrative that these things are a binary, you know, think about Claude Levi Strauss and binary opposites, you know, man, woman, male, female. Um, gay, straight, these things are being questioned and we start to see it more as a continuum, as a spectrum. So in some ways, incredulity towards meta-narratives can be a good thing. Equally, however, it can become a very dangerous thing. If you consider, you know, as we sat here in 2021, thinking about the ideas of post-truth and how that has been weaponized by uh, people in politics, especially in the political right. Um, you think about how politics is becoming more and more about propaganda and less and less about what might be considered in inverted commas an objective truth. So we are questioning all these meta narratives. We're seeing a rise in things like conspiracy theories and people who think the moon landings didn't happen and the world is flat. Um, so in some ways it can be a very healthy and positive force of good, but it can equally be a very harmful and very damaging thing in our society as well. So, art had always been about this idea of trying to capture the truth. But in the late 19th and early 20th century, we started to see the rise of what was called modernism. Modernism was about the shock of the new. It was the idea that art shouldn't just reflect reality. We were seeing all sorts of art movements in the early years of the 20th century, which were trying to do something different. We saw things like surrealism, Dada, futurism, abstract art, minimalism, where Art was trying to go beyond the simply representational and into something that captured some kind of deeper truth. Now, this was part and parcel of the technological changes in art because we had the invention in the late 19th century of photography and a few years later film. No painting, no sculpture 
could capture an, um, a, a realism as easily, cheaply and effectively as photography and film could. So art needed to do something different. It needed a new raison d'etre. It had to find some new approach. And, you know, we'll get art like Piet Mondrian's composition number 10 here. What does that mean? It has no obvious surface meaning. It's not representational, like that picture of the subportrait of Rembrandt was. It is far more open to personal interpretation. Another thing that ties in with this postmodernism is Roland Barthes' idea of the death of the author. Now I'm sure it meant something to Mondrian when he painted it and he was trying to communicate some particular meaning. But once the public get hold of it, then the artist lose control of it. The artist is no longer in control of that meaning and the public, the viewer, the spectator is left to come up with their own interpretation. Everybody looking at this image will come up with their own different response to it. Positive or negative doesn't really matter. It could be deeply moving or it could simply be pretty to look at. To a certain extent it doesn't matter. It's up to the viewer to find their own meaning in it. Now of course you could argue that if the artist has done their job properly then it should be obvious what the meaning is. But sometimes you might be being deliberately vague, deliberately leaving it to polysemic interpretation. So art had to do something new. This was modernism. But by the late early, sorry, late 20th century, the early 21st century, art was moving on. Society and art was starting to reject this very idea of truth, or indeed the very idea of anything like um, objective truth or objective reality. We were also coming to the conclusion that we had used up all the good ideas. It was impossible to be original anymore. Nothing was new. All we could do was sift through the ashes of the past, rehash old ideas. Here we've got Andy Warhol's Marilyn Diptych from 1962. And here he's saying something about the idea of the image, of representation, of iconography, of semiotics. We bring Roland Barthes into it. He's taken this image of Marilyn Monroe and by constantly repeating it and copying it and copying it and copying it, the image degrades. So he's saying something about the modern world and how images are degraded by their sheer um, ability to be replicated. He's picking Marilyn Monroe because she herself is iconic. When you think about it, you know, Norma Jean Baker, the real woman, wasn't Marilyn Monroe. Marilyn Monroe was a, a persona, a character really she played and she became this icon of beauty to the extent that even today she's still a household name amongst people who've never seen one of her films, never seen anything other than, you know, posters they won't have heard any of the songs she sung, you know, but the image, the image is so powerful that it carries on. And that image has been replicated over and over again. We still see stars like Madonna in the 90s and even to a certain extent Lady Gaga today playing on that Marilyn Monroe image because it's become iconic. So 
it tells us something about the lack of originality that we get in modern society. And again, if we look at how this is affecting media in general, we can see that there's very little in the way of originality anymore. I mean, look at cinema. It's reboots, it's remakes, it's franchises, it's, um, you know, making copies of copies of copies of copies. So originality is very difficult in today's day and age. It's hard for any pop musician to shock the public like someone like Jerry Lee Lewis or Elvis did. And even they were just copying the styles of black musicians and making it palatable for a white American audience. So what are some of the elements of postmodernism that we're going to be looking at? Well, these tie in with what people like Venturi, Scott Brown and Isenor were saying. And we've got some other things I've thrown into the mix here as well. So one of the things that's distinctly postmodern is the idea of surface of style of content, of things being pretty to look at but ultimately hollow. There's also the idea of bricolage. Bricolage is where you take all sorts of different influences from all sorts of different places and mash them up to create something new. Um, the mashup which you see in music and on YouTube videos is a very postmodern concept. We've also got the concept of pastiche and parody. To pasty something is to copy the style of something. So if we look at genre studies, for example, I think Steve Neal, we think that, you know, you've seen one action movie, you've seen them all. You've seen one superhero movie, you've seen them all. They all copy the same style. You know, you see, you know, Harry Potter comes out and then a few years later you get Percy Jackson, which is just a copy of Harry Potter. You get you know, something like Battle Royale come out and then a few years later you get the Hunger Games and then a few years later you get the Maze Runner. Copies of copies of copies. Parody is where you do the same thing but you are deliberately making fun of what you are copying. Both of these also tie into the idea of homage. To homage something is to pay homage to it, to honour it. So a pastiche is where you copy something because you love it. A parody is where you copy something and you're making fun of it, but even that could be because you love it. Another thing, Julia Chris Davis' concept of intertextuality, this is where one media text references another media text. This is distinctly postmodern. Then we've got the idea of self referentiality, the meta textual. This is where a media text acknowledges that it's a media text. Now this can be as simple as using the non-continuity montage system of editing where you're not made to note this the filmmaking, the subconsciously flashy, arty kind of filmmaking style. But it could be something like Brechtian alienation devices like breaking the fourth wall. It can be things like um, referencing in other texts through intertextuality. Whatever the case is, you're constantly drawing the audience's attention to the fact that they are watching a film or television show. Then we've got Leotard's concept of the rejection of truth and merit meta narratives that I've already explained. There's also this idea in postmodernism that there's no difference between high culture and low culture, high art and low art. So by high art, we're thinking the classical arts. We're thinking Shakespeare and ballet and Mozart and um, Coolidge and all these, you know, people like Rembrandt. Classical art meant for a highbrow, sophisticated audience. By low culture, we're thinking pop music and sitcoms and Stephen King novels stuff that is generally considered popular but trashy. Things can go from being low culture to high culture. Jazz is the classic example of this. Once upon a time jazz was low culture pop music that had no respect. Now it's considered high culture. 
let's not forget that even Shakespeare, his plays were designed to not just appeal to the upper classes, to the you know the royalty of Europe, but it was also meant to be played in pub full courts to the paying public, which is why it's full of fart jokes and lob gags. And then another thing that is in itself self-referential and meta is the deconstruction of language and how language shapes meaning. So, you know, films, for example, that deconstruct the genre, like the famous sequence is Scream, where one of the characters explains to the other characters how slasher movies work in a slasher movie. So these are some of the key things we can think about with postmodernism. So for Venturi, Scott Brown and Isenor, these are the key ones they were looking at. The idea of surface, of bricolage, of pastiche and parody. Um, I've explained all these before, but um, I think surface in particular, this idea that postmodernism tends to be hollow and empty and not really mean anything. There's a, there's a certain thing you can, you know, there's no substance behind or all. So style over content, style over substance is a very postmodern thing. I've explained the other ones, so we won't go through those again. So let's talk about the key theorist here, which is Jean Bourgeois. He was a very controversial French philosopher. He's best known for these two books, Simulacre and Simulation, and The Gulf War Did Not Take Place. He was interested in the image of things. Okay, So he was interested in how increasingly people today can't tell the difference between the real and the fake, between the authentic and the inauthentic. So when he writes a book called The Gulf War Did Not Take Place, he doesn't literally mean there was no war. He's not denying that the war happened. What he's denying is that the idea of the Gulf War that the general public had in their head was very different to the reality of what actually happened. When he's talking about the Gulf War, he's talking about the, the per first Persian War back in the uh, 1988-1990, when Britain, America, France, Saudi Arabia, a bunch of other countries went to eject Saddam Hussein's Iraq out of Kuwait because the Iraqis invaded Kuwait. This was a war on the Allies side that was remarkably bloodless. Casualty rates were exceptionally low. Um, for a hundred days the Allied air forces pummeled the Iraqi army into submission and when we finally invaded they melted away very rapidly. And Casualties on the Allied side were in the hundreds. Casualties on the Iraqi side were in the tens of thousands. But the Western militaries and governments had an incredibly sophisticated system of propaganda in place. Learning from the mistakes of the Vietnam War, they very strictly controlled the media. So. We never saw footage of American tanks bulldozing Iraqi conscripts and burying them alive in their own trenches. What we saw on the television on a daily basis was laser guided smart bombs going exactly down the chimney. We saw shots of tanks shooting other tanks. We didn't see dead bodies. We didn't see mangled flesh and burnt corpses. We did not see the effects of our violence. So what he's saying is that what we thought the war was and what the war actually was, two completely different things. It was a hyper real war. To us it was like watching somebody playing a video game. It was smart missiles being fired from, the cruise missiles being fired from hundreds of miles away and hitting their targets with pinpoint accuracy. We didn't see the collateral damage. We didn't see the bombs that missed their target and, you know, blew up a shopping centre or something. So that's what he meant by the Gulf War didn't take place. He was talking about the image of the Gulf War. 
is not the same thing as the actual war. By simulacra and simulation, he's saying that we're, you know, we're not looking at anything authentic or real anymore, but copies of copies of copies. See what I mean by this? He says that in postmodern culture, the boundaries between the real world and the world represented by the media have collapsed. It's no longer possible to distinguish between the reality and the simulation. If we think about Simulac and Simulation, for those of you who have seen the film The Matrix, which is a film about a simulated world, there is a sequence in that where the woman with the white rabbit on her shoulder goes to Neo to buy some computer discs and he has them hidden in the book and the book he's got them hidden in is Baudrillard's Simulacra and Simulation which is a neat little in-joke for people who are in on the idea of what postmodernism because that film is about a simulated world that people can't tell the real from the fake they misinterpreted his theories quite frankly but you know it was a good joke when you were in university when that film came out studying this stuff like I was and I was like ah see what they did there so, basically, this is all about the fact that it's no longer possible to distinguish between the reality and the simulation. So, look at this, right? On the, he said, in a postmodern world of simulacra, we are immersed in a world of images, the images of the simulacra, but they no longer refer to anything real, which he calls a referent. So on the right here we have the simulacra. The simulacra is Disney's Magic Kingdom, which as you can see is designed to look like a European castle. But at no point in the history of castle building has anybody ever built a castle that looks like that. But it is clearly influenced by, as you can see on the left, buildings like Neuschwanstein Castle in Germany. That is the referent. So, Disney's Magic Kingdom is the simulacra that is referring to the referent of Neuschwanstein Castle. But, and this is the thing, Neuschwanstein Castle isn't a real castle. It was built in 1886. No one in 1886 needed castles. Castles were obsolete. Neuschwanstein Castle is in itself a pastiche of a castle. It is not a real castle. It is a fake castle. It's a real building. You can go there, you can visit it. But it is not like, I don't know, a couple of miles away from where I'm sat right now, I could be going to Bolsover Castle or I could go into be to, you know, Connorsborough Castle. They're real castles and neither of them look like that. So it's a fake of a fake of something that might once have been real. But he's saying that we can no longer tell the difference between the real and the authentic and the fake and the artificial. You can go to somewhere like a shopping mall. Shopping malls are classically postmodern places. They are, I mean, if you go to the Meadow Hall, for example, outside Sheffield, and you go to the lanes, that's meant to look like some kind of little back alley full of little boutique-y kind of stores, but it's fake. It's artificial. It's not a real, authentic public space. It is a private space that's meant to feel public. And there will be plastic plants in it. And, you know, you go to the supermarket and you can smell freshly baked bread. Well, that's probably being, as an artificial scent, being pumped through the air conditioning system to make you feel hungry and buy bread, right? But we can't tell, right? We are unaware of the difference between the fake and the real. Which brings us to social media. Social media is the ultimate in hyper-reality. You have friends on social media, but how many of them are actual friends? How many of them are actually people that you know? Right? We all are mediating ourselves, our own lives. We are curating our social media to make us more attractive, more exciting, and more interesting than they really are. 
we are creating this ideal self that we are promoting to the world where every photograph we every selfie we take is trying to make us look more attractive we look put filters on them and maybe put them through Photoshop and take dozens and dozens and dozens of them until they're exactly right. You know, we are obsessed with mediating this world that we live in. You go to a gig and there are people all sat there just filming it or photographing it and you're thinking, why are you, this band's like 20 feet in front of you, why are you sat behind a screen? When are you ever going to watch these videos ever again? Who are you trying to impress? Is this just for your Instagram? Is it just for your Facebook? Your Twitter? You know? Just be there. Just be there and enjoy the experience of being there. People go out on a night out. You go to a restaurant. And they're like, oh, don't eat your dinner first. Let's take a photograph of it. Why are you photographing my dinner? I want my dinner. Right? The enjoyment in the dinner is in eating it in company that I enjoy, not mediating the experience for a bunch of people I don't know on Instagram. So there's this, we're all living in this hyper-reality, we're creating this hyper-reality, this fake world that we all live in. Go and look at the boyfriends of Instagram account. It's hilarious. It's bursting the bubble of the artifice of social media and how people try to mediate their life on Instagram in particular. But it's bursting that bubble behind it all. Then we've got this idea of intertextuality with Julia Kristeva and she's talking about how one media text will pastiche and reference other ones. Shows like Family Guy and um, The Simpsons and films like, you know, even going back to things like Blazing Saddles and stuff, um, work entirely on intertextuality. This of course is Family Guy Blue Harvest, where Family Guy remade the Star Wars trilogy, but as Family Guy. And as you can see, they have copied the original Star Wars poster with Family Guy characters to promote the Family Guy Blue Harvest show. So intertextuality is a key element of postmodernism as well. So that is a very, very, very simplified and basic introduction to postmodernism. So we're thinking about those key elements of the metatextual, of acknowledging that it is a media text by dissecting the language of the text and taking it apart and seeing how it works. We've got this idea of incredulity towards meta-narratives when you're no longer believing that the way things have always been done is the way they should continue to be done. We're doubting those big ideas, those big myths that we tell ourselves. We've got the idea of the surface, the style of content, that it looks pretty but doesn't really mean anything. We've got the idea of bricolage, where you're taking ideas from all over different places and mashing them up to create something new. We've got the idea that nothing can be original anymore, which is why you have to have bricolage. We've also got the idea of um, pastiche and parody and homage, as well as the intertextuality. So those are the, the core elements that we need to be looking for in postmodernism for A-level media. As I said, postmodernism is a staggeringly complicated subject and I have tried to dumb it down as much as I can because you don't need to know any more than that really. Right, so if you've got any questions you know where I am and I'll see you in the next one.